recently, I was reading about a, a Korean Christian man. He was a leader in his church in Korea, and his church had sent him to the United States to come here to study and to learn and, and to grow his faith and his skills. I don't know how long he was in the United States. It was a while. He traveled widely, um, went to many, many churches, heard hundreds of sermons. Hundreds of sermons. And as he was preparing to leave the United States, um, he was interviewed. And the interviewer asked him if he were to sum up all those sermons that he had heard, how might he sum up all those sermons? And the young man didn't think very long before he said, please, if it is possible, try to be good. Please, if it is possible, try to be good. Real helpful, don't you think? Now, tell me in there where you hear God's plan, God's work, or God's gifts. Tell me where in there you hear any good news at all. On this day, right before we enter into the season of Lent, we have this incredible story of the transfiguration. Jesus is going away to pray. Um, we read about this fairly regularly, Jesus setting himself apart. Jesus going to a lonely place. Jesus taking a time out from ministry and the work and the world in order to pray and to be silent and to be with God. And on this day, as he has done that, he has taken with him Peter and James and John, and they've gone away, they've gone up a mountain to pray, to be still, um, to rejuvenate. And in the midst of that, uh, this otherworldly thing happens. Jesus is changed. He is transfigured. And, and he, he is glowing and his clothing is so dazzling that they don't even have anything really earthly that they can compare it to. It is a holy moment. And if to not make it more holy, two dead guys show up. Moses and Elijah. Uh, Moses represents the giving of the law. Elijah uh, represents the Old Testament prophets. They show up. Now, since uh, the disciples do not have Facebook, how do they know it's Moses and Elijah? Because it's a holy moment. In a holy moment, people know things. So Jesus is dazzling, and, and Elijah's there, and Moses is there, and, and the disciples are in awe. They're terrified, and, and, and for want of something to say, oh, our Peter always has to say something, let's build shelters. Building shelters would commemorate the moment, but if you build a shelter, what is the shelter for? For people to live in, right? So if you build a shelter for Moses and Eliza and Jesus, surely they're going to stay there, right? And we can hold on to this holy moment. Holy moments are not meant to hold on to. Holy moments are embedded on us so that we can go out and be about the work that we are called to. But in this holy moment, up on the mountain, there is an unveiling. Christ's glory is unveiled up on that mountaintop. An unveiling. Now today, in the letter to the Corinthians, Paul also talks about veil and unveiled. 
And specifically, what he is talking about is the veiling of the word and what works towards veiling that word. And, and the phrase that Paul uses today are the God, is the God, lower case G, the God of this word, world that veils the word. Now, we could certainly think the God of this world, lowercase g, as Satan, but that's probably making it too simplistic. The gods of this world are whatever idol veils the word. Now, folks, we got idols to spare. I mean, I know that we think that those, those people from the Old Testament, you know, they had a lot of idols. Um, we have lots and lots of idols, whether it's the idol of, of status or the idol of youth or the idol of, of particular uh, beauty, the idol of stuff, the idol of more stuff, the idol of yet more stuff, the idol of, of, of climbing some sort of ladder in terms of our career. But I think the possibility is the greatest idol that we have is the idol of self. When we get in the way, the idol of, please, if it is all possible, try to be good. That is the idol of me. That is the idol that I can do this if I just try a little bit harder, if I tug harder on those bootstrings. Paul goes on to say, there is one message and there is one message only, and that is Christ and Christ crucified. That is it. The transfiguration isn't about building booths. It's about God's glory shining in and through Christ. And our transformation, the transformation that God wants and desires to unfold in us is about God's plan, God's work, God's gifts. So, the transfiguration up on the side of the mountain, our own transformation, both, are the passive results of direct divine intervention. They are this God who's bringing about unprecedented changes in our lives, in us, morphing us into the people that he created us to be, the people that he desires us to be in the transfiguration, in our own transformation, what happens is the veil of heaven is pulled back and we are left to bow reverently in the glory of our God. Amen.